The Cube's live coverage is made possible by funding from Dell Technologies, creating technologies that drive human progress. Hi everybody, we're back at the FIDA in Barcelona, winding up our four day wall to wall coverage of MWC 23. The Cube has been thrilled to cover the telco transformation. Dave Vellante with Dave Nicholson. Really excited to have NTT on. Shahed Ahmed is the group VP of new ventures and innovation at NTT, in from Chicago. Welcome to Barcelona, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having me over. So really interesting title you have. You know, people might not know NTT, you know, huge, you know, Japan telco, but a lot of other businesses. Explain your business. So we do a lot of things. We are, uh, most of us are known for our Docomo business in Japan. We have a, one of the largest uh, wireless cellular carriers in the world. Uh, we serve most of Japan. Outside of Japan, we are B2B systems integration professional services company. So we offer managed services, we have data centers, we have undersea cables, um, we offer all kinds of outsourcing services. So we're, um, we're a big company. So there's a narrative out there that says, you know, 5G is a lot of hype, not, not a lot of adoption, nobody's ever going to make money at 5G. Uh, you have a different point of view. I understand, you're like leaning into 5G and you've actually got some traction there, explain that. So 5G can be viewed from two lenses. One is just you and I using our cell phones and we get 5G coverage over it and the other one is for businesses to use 5G and we call that private 5G or enterprise grade 5G. Two very separate distinct things but it is 5G in the end. Now, the big debate here in Europe and US is how to monetize 5G. As a consumer, you and I are not going to pay extra for 5G. I mean, I haven't. I just expect the carrier to offer faster, cheaper services. And so, would I pay extra? Not really. I just want a reliable network from my carrier. You paid up for the good camera though, didn't you? They, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for four cameras now. <laughs> um, so, the carriers are, are in this little bit of a pickle at the moment because they've just spent billions of dollars, not only on spectrum, but the infrastructure needed to upgrade to 5G, yet nobody's willing to pay extra for that 5G service. All right. So what do they do? And one idea is to look at enterprises, companies, industrial companies, manufacturing companies, who want to build their own 5G networks to support their own use cases. And these use cases could be anything from automating the surveyor belt to cameras with 5G in it, to AGVs, these are little carts running around warehouses picking up products and goods, but they have to be connected all the time. Wi-Fi doesn't work all the time there. And so, those businesses are willing to pay for 5G. So your question is, is there a business case for 5G? Yes. I don't think it's in the consumer side, I think it's in the business side, and that's where NTT is finding success. So, you said how, you know, how they're going to make money, right? You, you, you very well described the telco dilemma. We heard earlier this week, you know, well we could tax the OTT vendors, like Netflix of course shot back and said, well we spend a lot of money on content, we're driving a lot of value, why don't you help us pay for the content development, which is incredibly expensive. I think I heard we're going to tax, tax the developers for API calls on the network. I, I'm not sure how well that's going to work out. Look at, look at Twitter, you know, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and then yeah, there's the, there's the B2B piece. What's your take on, we heard the Orange CEO say, we need help, you know, maybe implying when it attacks the OTT vendors, but we're for net neutrality, which seems like it's completely counterposed. What's your take on, you know, fair share in the network? Look, we've seen this debate unfold in the US for the last 10 years. Yeah. Tom Wheeler, the FCC chairman, started that debate and 
they made great progress in open internet and net neutrality. The thing is that if you create a, a lane, a tollway, where some companies have to pay toll and others can, don't have to, you create an environment where the innovation could be stifled. Content providers may not appear on the scene anymore. Yeah. And with everything happening around AI, we may see that backfire. So creating a toll for rich companies to be able to pay that toll and get on a faster speed internet, that's, that, that may, um, may work. Some places may backfire in others. It's, it, it's, you know, you're bringing up a great point. It's one of those sort of unintended consequences. You got to be, be careful because the little guy gets crushed in that environment and, and, and then, then what, right? Then you stifle innovation so okay, so you you you're a fan of net neutrality. You think the balance that the U.S. model for change, maybe the U.S. got it right instead of like GDPR, who sort of informed right. the U.S. on privacy. Maybe the opposite on net neutrality. I think so. I mean, look, the way the U.S., particularly the FCC and the um, and the FTC, uh, uh, has mandated these these rules and regulation. I think it's a nice balance. FTC is all looking at big tech at the moment. But Lena Khan wants to break up big tech. I mean, yeah. for, you know, you big tech, right. boom, break right. them up, right? So, but that's, you know. That's, that's a whole different story. Yeah, right. We could talk about that too if you want. Right, right, <laughs> right. But I, I, I think the, our, we have a balanced approach, um, measured approach, asking the content providers or the developers to pay for your innovative, creative application that's on your phone. You know, that's asking for too much, in my opinion. You know, I think you're right though. Government did do a good job with net neutrality in the US. And I don't, I mean, generally, I'm just going to go to my high horse for a second, so <laughs> forgive me. Go for it. Market forces have always done a better job at, at adjudicating you know, competition. Now, if a company's a monopoly, in my view, they should be you know, regulated or at least penalized. Yeah, but, but generally speaking, you know, the attack on big tech, I think is perhaps misplaced. I sat through, and the reason it's relevant to Mobile World Congress or MWC is, I sat through a Nokia presentation this week, and they were talking about Bell Labs. When the United States broke up, yeah. you know, the, the US telcos, yeah. Bell Labs was a gem yeah. in the US, and now it's owned by Nokia, yeah. right? And so, you got to be careful about, you know, what you wish for with breaking up big tech. You got AI, You've got you know, competition with China, so. Yeah, I, but, I, I, yeah but, but the upside to breaking up Ma Bell was not just the baby bells and maybe the, 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 the stranded orphan asset of Bell Labs, but I would argue it led to innovation. I'm old enough to remember. I would say it made the US less I competitive. Know, know. No. You, you were in junior high school, but, but I remember <laughs> as an adult having a rotary <laughs> dial phone and having to pay, pay for that access. Yeah, but there they was all no came system. back together, the baby no. bells are all, they got all acquired oh, yeah. and the cable company, it was no different, so I, I don't know. Do you have but, a perspective yeah, on this? Because yeah, you know I mean, this better than I do. Well, I think, look at Nokia, just they announced a whole new branding strategy and a new brand. Which I like the brand, Yeah, and looks it, cool. But guess what, it's B2B oriented. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's no longer consumer yeah, yeah. because yeah. they felt that that Nokia brand phone was sort of misleading towards a lot of um, business to business work that they do. And so they've oriented themselves to B2B. Look, my point is, the carriers and the service providers, network operators, um, and look, I'm, I'm a network operator too in, in, in Japan. We need to innovate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Nobody's stopping us from coming up with a content strategy. Nobody's stopping a carrier from building a interesting new over the top app. In fact, we have better control over that because we are closer to the customer. We need to innovate. We need to be more creative. I don't think putting taxing the little developer that's building a very innovative application is going to help in the long run. What, what, NCT in Japan, what, do they have a content play? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Is that, are they strong in content? Or competitive, we, we, like Netflix-like? or We have relationships with them and you remember iMode? Yeah, oh yeah, Remember sure. in the old days? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a big yeah. hit. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Right? I mean, that was actually the original app marketplace. 
right. and the um, application store. So, um, of course, we've evolved from that, and we should. And that's this is an evolution, and we should look at it more positively, instead of looking at ways to regulate it. We should let it prosper well, and let it see but where why, it is. Why do you think the telcos generally have failed at content? I mean, AT&T is sort of the exception that proves the rule. I mean, they got some great properties, obviously, CNN and HBO, well, but generally it's, it's viewed as a challenging asset and others have had to d diversify and, or you know, sell the assets. Why do you think the telcos have had such trouble there? Well, Comcast owns also a lot of content. Yeah, um, and, yeah absolutely. And I think, I think that is definitely a strategy that should be explored here in Europe. And I think um, that has been underexplored, in my opinion. I, I believe that the, uh, every large carrier must have some sort of content strategy at some point or else you are a pipe. Yeah, you lose touch with the customer. Yeah, and by the way, being a dumb pipe is okay. No, it's a lucrative business. It's a good business. <laughs> you just have to focus. And if you start to do a lot of ancillary things around it, then you start to see the margins erode. But if you just focus on being a pipe, I think that's a very good business and it's very lucrative. Everybody wants bandwidth. There's insatiable demand for bandwidth all the time. Enjoy the monopoly, I say. Yeah, <laughs> well so ca capital is like an organism in and of itself. It's going to seek a place where it can insert itself and grow. Do you think that the questions around fair share right now are having people wait in the wings to see what's going to happen? Because especially if I'm on the small end of creating content, creating services, and there, there's possibly a death blow to my fixed costs that could be coming down the line, I'm going to hold back and wait. Do you, do you think that the answer is, let's solve this sooner than later? What are, you, what are your thoughts? I think um, in Europe, the opinion has been always to go after the big tech. I mean, we've seen a lot of moves either through antitrust um, right. or other means. Or the guillotine. That's right, the <laughs> guillotine. Uh, yes, and I've, I've heard those directly. <laughs> um, I, I think, look, in the end, um, EU has to decide what's right for their constituents, their, the countries they operate, and the economy. Frankly, with where the economy is, you've got recession, inflation pressures, a war, and who knows what else might come down the pipe. I would be very careful and messing with this uh, equilibrium and this economy. Um, and, and, until at least we have gone through this inflation and recessionary pressure and see what happens. I, again, I think I come back to markets ultimately will adjudicate. I think what we're seeing with ChatGPT is like a Netscape moment in some ways. And I can't predict what's going to happen, but I, I can predict that it's going to change the world and there's going to be new disruptors that come about. It just, I don't think Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple are going to rule the world forever. They just, I guarantee they're not. You know, so they'll make it through, but there's going to be some new companies that might be open AI, might not be. Give us a plug for NTT at the show. What do you guys got going here? Really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we're, we're showing off our private 5G network for enterprises, for businesses. Um, we see this as a huge opportunity. If you look around here, you've got Rode and Schwartz, that's the industrial company. You've got Airbus here. Um, all the big industrial companies mm. are here, automotive companies, and uh, private 5G. 5G inside a factory, inside a hospital, a warehouse, a mining operation. That's where the, the, that's where the dollars are. Is it a meaningful business for you today? It is. We yeah. just started this business only a couple of years ago. We're seeing amazing growth and um, I think there's a lot of good opportunities there. Shahed Ahmed, thanks so much for coming to theCUBE. It was great to have you, really a pleasure. Thanks for having me over. Great All right, you're questions. Welcome. All right, for David Nicholson and Dave Vellante, we'll be back right after this short break from the FIDA in Barcelona, MWC 23. You're watching theCUBE.